Well, it's like a dream. Um, it's different. We haven't done a package type like this for quite a while. And first of all, it's extremely professional. All the crews get on with each other. So from a, you know, a working point of view, it's painless. Um, it, these things can be a nightmare. But um, it's great. The Nugent people and the Skinner people are fantastic to work with. And they've all got their fans in the crowd and the whole thing is great. It's a nice atmosphere. So we're enjoying it very much. We're having to adjust to the short, shorter set. And uh, so we're having more arguments than usual of what to leave out. But they're not really arguments. They're more ferocious fights. No, no, it's just um, debates. But um, no, it's great, very good. Even though the, the three bands are, are similar in, in, in their, their era and their genre, they really come from some pretty different backgrounds. Uh, do you have any, has there any, been anything interesting about that between you, know, you guys from overseas and then we got down south you got Ted Nugent, you know, hunting buffalo. <laughs> uh, it, uh, how's that coming together? I don't know, I suppose we, again, it's the sort of thing that you would focus on and the sort of thing I suppose that some of the fans focus on, but not many. Um, <clears throat> they obviously, each act has its own following. And I've found that so far, everyone's really enjoying the other, sh the other bands that they haven't seen before, maybe. So, uh, um, that works very well. As far as the um, backgrounds there, they are different. There's no two ways about it. But it, even so, I mean, you break it down, Deep Purple, everyone in the band comes from a different background. So um, it's just your approach to music, really. And I think you've got a, a really interesting cross section of uh, styles you know, of, of playing and whatever. Works well. Have you played with any of these guys before? No. So this is the first time? Yeah. Um, play, but you know, play with. I've I've appeared on the same bill as just to close this one out. I was thinking about this the other day because people seem to be very intrigued about this purple, Skinner and Nugent and the disparity of the styles, if you like, or whatever. And I'm thinking, you know, it's it's not that odd, really. I mean, it's just fine. I've, I've and I was thinking about the bills that I've appeared on in various with different people, different bands, and whatever. Going back to on being on the same bill as Otis Redding and Dusty Springfield and yeah. you know the Rolling Stones and Zeppelin and T Rex and you know going to London Symphony Orchestra and it's last week I was singing a duet with Pavarotti in Italy so this isn't so strange it's 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 good. How was that? <laughs> that was it wasn't strange either you know Ness and Dorma is really a I mean a classic rock and roll tune. It's actually obviously not. It's a, an aria from Puccini's uh, turn dot, but um, I mean, it's classic rock tune. It could be. And uh, so it came very naturally. Mm. It was great, because I think, you know, there's no way I was going to sort of try and sing it as an opera singer. But, you know, the, the, apart from the way in which we sing, which is different. I mean, we all project from the diaphragm and we all use our heads and our voice boxes and that sort of thing. So in terms of technique, there's a difference. But, um, and he's a brilliant singer. He doesn't know two ways about it. He's amazing. But um, uh, it was great. It was stunning, stunning. To, and it was great, a nice big benefit show. You know, working with George Benson and Anastasia, and I mean, it was great. I loved it. Was, the, was it kind of intimidating to go on the stage with somebody who has uh, such a presence? No, I don't think so. He was a great, great artist, and I think, from my experience, the bigger and the better the people are, the less frightening it is to work with them. Yeah. Um, you work to the highest common denominator, and you know it's going to be quality stuff. And so you don't worry about the things that you do with perhaps slightly lesser um, people in a technical sense, you know. Uh, what can I say? I got the collie wobbles, as I always do, but I've got them right now. We're doing a show tonight, and uh, around lunchtime, I get those 
feathers in my stomach and I, you know, it's not stage fright. What it is is it excitement that builds up and it's the beginnings of adrenaline and uh, you have to discipline yourself to hold it back until the moment when you hit the stage running. So That hasn't changed over the years? No. No, I think I'd quit if it did and that would be, then we'd be, that would be cabaret then, you know. No, no. <coughs> it's very exciting still. What do you, uh, switching gears a little bit, about the state of, of rock and roll, or is there new music that's being made, that's being listened to, that's being released, that you think measures up to the things that uh, Deep Purple, I don't know. Skinner, Nugent? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I listen to a lot of live music and I hear, the same as I always did, live great musicians. <coughs> you can look at it from many, many different ways. There's a band in, strangely enough, they're called Cat Scratch Fever. Um, there's a band in Liverpool. Stunning trio. The guy was amazing. And I went to talk to him afterwards. He was selling some CDs on the side of the stage. I said, you know, have any A&R people been near your band? Because you... Um, you look awesome, you sound great, and your material is wonderful. He said, oh, cheers, mate. Well, and uh, he made it very clear that if, if they got wind of anyone from a record label in London coming, they'd cancel the show or they'd move on and do something else. There's no way they'd want to be involved in the contemporary record scene. And I know an awful lot of people like that now. They just want to play their music. You know, the industry is a bizarre place, sometimes very good and sometimes very bad. And one of the most disgraceful things that's happened over the last 15, 20 years is the abrogation of responsibility as far as developing artists is concerned. You've seen it in Manchester, you've seen it in Seattle, you've seen it you know, in smaller scale in many different times. Something comes, they find something that's doing very well underground and they pluck it from obscurity and all of a sudden it's on MTV and on, you know, whatever. And the next minute, every record label and A&R man in, is there. And it, it's like a shark attack. You know, there's blood on the streets. Hey, hey you, yeah, you, yeah, come here, sign here, you know. And, there, and you've got a whole swarm of bands that have only been, you know, only held an instrument for a few minutes. But they look great because they're, you know, good-looking kids. And they're right there as far as clothes and everything else is concerned. And contemporary fashion and the right rebellious attitude, which all of which are important ingredients. But they haven't had a chance to... Um, learn their craft yet or on the upshot of that I mean I could ramble on about this for hours but the tragic side is and I won't name them because I just think it's unfair but there was a band that had a, a big hit a couple of years ago and they were playing on a festival and I went there early to see them and they were doing a 40 minute spot and they played their their number one single three four times they they were a shambles they were out of tune they were huddled together in the middle of the stage. They didn't know what to do. They had no experience. They were terrified. And of course, they accepted, on the advice of their management and record label, they should do all these big labels. And it totally destroyed their careers. Totally, because everyone went, you know, this is a joke. These are amateurs. And that's what they were, were amateurs. They, I know the singer had a fantastic voice, fabulous voice. But he didn't yet have to learn how to use it live. And that takes many years to get it right. Some, some are quicker than others. So when you ask me, and what am I hearing? Now, I'm hearing a lot of contrived stuff at the moment that's m artificially manufactured coming through the industry, um, with a few exceptions. But those, my daughter would probably be more aware of than I am. I've never been wrapped up with the music scene as such. To me, being a lyricist and a singer, I tend to get more excited about um, things that move me emotionally, things that make me angry, you know, politics, c certain other things, um, lots of other things Whatever. that make me cry, make me happy, make me angry, whatever, Think everyday things that you would react to the same, uh, not the same things necessarily, but we all have our things that, yeah, geez, that's wrong, you know, or whatever, so you write about it. And that, those are my stimulants, if you like, my intellectual or spiritual stimulants is what moves me as a person. Um, and I can naturally work with the rest of the guys. Um, they've got it in their blood. They've been playing all their lives. I don't think 
we've gone through that thing now of, um, you know, that false maturity to the fact we really are mature now. And we're not trying to be like kids anymore. So I, I don't write, tend to write in the same way about fast cars and loose women as I used to a long time ago. Still write about them, but in a slightly different way. And I think really, you're ex I would expect people of my age to be perhaps a little more dignified, a little more, no less crazy necessarily, or no less, no less committed, but just you do things in a different way than you do when you're a kid. Um, I feel as powerfully as I do about everything. But I figured it was time to get my hair cut, you know? And uh, it just kind of was about, I had this thing hanging down, tied behind my head, because it was getting in my beer, and that was it. And the only yeah, time right. I'd take it off was when I was singing, and it seemed false. It seemed like I was hanging onto some old relic of a T-shirt or something like that, you know, an identity thing that I had to let go. So I thought, well, cut it off. And it's great, because when I go swimming now, I don't get in my eyes, my face, and whatever. And I feel completely natural again. It's like a prop, and you, a superstitious thing. When you get rid of it, you feel naked again. So you, you, you've got to be honest with yourself. So are you, are, have you been freed because of it, that you don't have that now? And you're kind it, of it's symbolic in a way, but I don't think it's actually that. I think you come to the state of mind before that. I mean, I meditate a lot, and uh, I think address the important things to me. I have conversations with myself once I become disembodied and get into my own spiritual world, I find that um, the more I practice that, the easier I can become, um, that I can deal with things. I find things that were a constant amazement to me are now obvious. And, and some of them are so obvious that I wondered why I never thought of them before. Just silly things, you know. Maturity. That's what it is, expansion, perspective, that sort of thing. Yeah, you've had a, an incredible journey, and it's still going on. How, how do you sum up all the roads you've traveled <coughs> between Deep Purple, and well, Tom Monic, and Pavarotti, and uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, and I mean, Black how, Sabbath. Black Sabbath. <laughs> uh, how, how do you put something like that in perspective when? I don't know. Such a, such a yeah, I never think about it. Road. It's. Um, I know I feel good. I know I feel fit. Um, and I know I'm stimulated by what's going on. Deep Purple's a family again, um, as it was in '69 for a few years, and was again for a while in the '80s. Um, and it's really a family. I mean, Steve Steve Morse has been with us for seven years now, and uh, you know, the first couple of years it takes people a while to adjust within and without the band. Um, but he's an integral part now, very much. Well, we're all individuals, but we're a family, you know. And uh, so I think that produces a confidence um, and a relaxation. And when you're relaxed and confident, you can be more expressive. Instead of building this defensive little thing around you which protects what you've got already in case it gets chipped away at. So you, you develop a thick skin or something like that. But right now, you, when, you, when we do feel confident, you don't mind being, people taking chunks out of you because uh, uh, you, it's, it doesn't hurt. How has, uh, how has the music making process changed within Deep Purple over the years? Not in the slightest. Really? Uh, one word sums it up, haphazard, that's it. You know, we get together. Roger and I have been writing together since 65. Uh, we were in a band before we joined Purple together as a songwriting unit as well as being a singer and a bass player. And um, so we get to the studio, let me, an average day, not every day, but an average day would be Steve and Pacey are in there around noon in the rehearsal room or one of the places we use in Florida. and. Uh, you know, they'll just jam for an hour. And, but Roger will be there already. I'll be there drinking coffee and scribbling notes, making phone calls and whatever. Roger will be there and he'll have his, either his dat or his mini disc player now, whatever, um, recording everything. Then we get in and review some stuff and play. And we work all afternoon. Um, it's, it's like going to the office, 12 till 6, then we break and everyone 
goes off, has a drink, has some dinner, watches TV, goes to movies, whatever. And uh, and then around nine o'clock in the evening, um, Roger and I get back together again, and we review all the work that we've done during the day, and including the jam that's taken place at noon. And then we either work on some lyrics together, or I leave and Roger just spends all night editing this stuff to, to the really interesting bits so that we can review them the next day, stuff that happens spontaneously. And the great thing about Purple is that it's a jamming band. There's a lot of improvisation and uh, um, you never quite, it's dangerous up there on stage and it's, we try and keep it the same way in the studio. Um, we're looking at a different process this time. The next album I'm hoping is going to be um, a producer involved. So it'll be an extra diet. We feel good enough now to throw ourselves bare to the producer. We normally very jealously guard this, um, what we do in the studio. But I think it's time, about time we had a producer. We're all agreed tonight. Give an objective point of view and push us around a little bit. Can you name names? Hmm? Can you name any names? Not right now. Okay. Well, forgive me my, my ignorance. Do you guys make the album, cut the tracks, everything without a producer? Well, we were, yeah, we had our sort of pet producer in-house, Roger Glover. Um, so he, Roger does it all? Yeah, well, he's a kind of co-thing, you know. We all sort of mooch around. Roger stays later at the studio than everyone else, so he gets credit. <laughs> <coughs> Roger's very methodical and very meticulous, and he's very good in the studio. And uh, the only reason we're not using him this time is because we thought the whole process, that's not just the sound, but also the writing process, for two reasons. One, we thought production takes away too much of his time because he's involved in production right from the beginning. And I'd certainly like him back on the lyrical side. Um, not necessarily we write everything together. Sometimes I'll write something entirely on my own and he'll just fool around with a couple of words and say this, that, the other. And sometimes we'll write something entirely together. I'd like to get a little more of Roger's stuff in um, to the writing to balance it up. And for the same reason, um, I think it would be good also to have an objectivity from a producer that we haven't had in a while. Um, Roger's seeing things from the inside out and we'd like to look at some... We have been self-critical of the records and um, there are things that could do with improvement. But it won't come with, from within us. It, it needs a, a new, a fresh ear. It just really surprises me that there's not a... Uh, Never has it, been. It, it, it just seems like such a... It's a garage band, really. We just go in the studio, jam, play, and that's it. Oh, that solo's, yeah, do another one. Okay, and that's it. What does it make you feel if you're uh, driving by a football field and you hear a band playing Smoke on the Water? It's great. I mean, Smoke on the Water I love. Um, it's, we, we, we're not much for reminiscing. Um, one, we did notice that one of the big penalties you pay for having a good history is that you've got a lot of um, baggage to carry around and people do tend to want to be nostalgic rather than looking to the future and that's our raison d'etre is to always um, be expressive and challenge ourselves to something new. Um, so we tend to be sometimes a little dismissive and we don't mean to be rude, but it's, yeah, yeah, okay. And we still do a lot of those songs in the show. And that's, obviously, we're very proud of our history. But we don't like to dwell on it. But when you hear something, you go, yeah, well, that's nice. But actually, it's great when you're in a car driving past a, <laughs> a situation like you described. But sometimes when you're out for a quiet beer and uh, you go into a place with a couple of mates and whatever, and somebody spots you in the corner, and then they crank up, and they, you know, put <laughs> smoke, highway star, Charlie Turner, da, 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 on the jukebox, and you say, oh, jeez, Christ, and everyone's, hey, how are you doing? All right, yeah, hi, how are you? That's great. That's okay. I mean, I'm eternally grateful for the way my life turned out, so you can never turn around and say, well, I wish it wouldn't happen, because I'm, I think it's fabulous. I couldn't, I wouldn't swap it for anything. It's a family affair, really, yeah. It's, you know, we've, we've had our ups and downs. There's been a turmoil. And uh, 
I think like like any family really it you know when you scatter there's a kind of spiritual gravity that draws you all back together again for well, most of you anyway um, but it's a happy time now um, it is a love affair yeah um, sometimes very passionate um, in all the ways that that word can be used so. as we walked in there's a lot of quite a bit of young faces out there yeah. 13, 14, 15 year olds. Does that give you a ray of hope for the future? Of, uh... Well, outside of the States, well, we haven't played much in the States, as you know. For We, we did a couple of tours. Um, but mostly, I mean, Purple's a very international band. And so in Europe and South America, Japan, Australia, and all of the Eastern Hemisphere. We figure the average age of our audience is around 18 years old. But you tend to get more extremes in America. You tend to get the people who are near our age with their kids. Yeah. Um, and that's great. Um, I'm grateful for anyone who buys a ticket. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And as for hope for the future, yeah, the only reason we exist is because we're very optimistic. And that's why we still practice. Um, because we figure that if you keep practicing, you'll be able to do it properly. And Steve Morse practices eight hours a day. And, um, you know, I, I work pretty hard on my lyrical stuff as well. So, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of commitment to it. A lot of these people that come along are actually stunned that there are still people who actually do care about playing their instruments. So, uh, as opposed to, you know, preening themselves and Looking wonderful. Thank you very much. Will you